It can be uh, a nice hedge for you if you're looking for stuff to replace uh, ficus for screening. It uh, can be a hedge or it can be a small tree depending on how you want it to grow. It has very tiny blooms but they are fragrant uh, so it's going to attract pollinators all year long. It gets orange berries on it that are going to attract the birds. It's good in full sun or partial sun. It has a high drought tolerance and a high salt tolerance. So if you have friends that live by the beach, that would be a good plant for them down there. And high drought tolerance is good. Just remember, all of your native plants, when you first put them in, it doesn't, just because they're native, doesn't mean they don't need water. They need water until they're established. But once they're established, you would have less watering in them if you plant the drought tolerant plants. Now if you had a wet area, this water drop wart attracts this black swallowtail. Also parsley. Par if you have a little herb garden and you're planting parsley, I plant the flat Italian parsley because I'm Italian, I have no use for that curly stuff. So, um, but again, the butterflies will lay their eggs on the underside. So when I go out to pick my parsley, I look underneath for us <laughs> to see if there's a tiny little round ball underneath there. Because if it is, then the swallowtail has, has laid an egg there. So I'll pick a different, pick a different Rose, one. I figure they get a percentage. I have had dill is another yes. thing. They love dill. If you can make a nice round bed of that and you watch the whole process. They chrysalis on it, and everything is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so there it's there. Like I said, butterfly gardening is, is a little unique. There's all different types of plants that different uh, butterflies will use. So, and that black swallowtail is one of the few that uses several different plants. So it's right here. See, herbs such as parsley, dill, and fennel. Fennel as well, they like that. Now, if you have a place in your garden where you can just leave a weedy patch and let the native stuff establish itself there, I'm, um, poor Bob Haley, who passed away, used to be the horticultural writer for the Sun Sentinel, was a dear friend of mine. He said I was from the Tidy Bowl School of Gardening because I liked it to look nice around the front of the house, you know? I like it that way, my neighbors like it that way. You want to keep the neighbors happy too, right? <laughs> but in the back, down by the canal, if I have a section there that I let go with, that's that Biden's I was telling about, the Spanish needle, um, you'll be surprised what you see pop up in there naturally. So just leave a little spot, a little weedy patch if you can. This is false nettle. I was pulling this out all the time. I, I would see the red admiral by my pool all the time. Especially the males. The males like to puddle. If you have a little bit of water on the cement, you'll see sometimes see the butterflies hanging out there or on the calf rock and stuff. They're not really going for the water. They're going for the minerals that are coming up in the water. The males need them for their reproduction. So I kept seeing the red admiral in my yard and going, what is attracting this red admiral? And then I looked and I said, oh, the false nettle. That stuff I've been ripping out. <laughs> Maybe I'll leave a few there now. <laughs> this is beautiful. I just found out about this plant last year um, from Alexander's Nursery, which is off of um, Flamingo Road, uh, right off of 595. If you get off at 595 and Flamingo and you head south, there's like a little road that runs parallel to it, a little access road back there. And Alexander Plant Farm and Nursery is there. They're a great supplier of native plants. And if you go in there asking for stuff and they don't have it, they'll get it for you when you you know when they can. But this I thought was absolutely beautiful, beautiful coral colored uh, vine. There's the passion vines again, and you can see the corky stem passion vine doesn't have much of a flower on it. The butterflies love it, the birds love it. It's not as showy for people. But the thing about the passion vine is as well, you don't need to have a trellis for it. The butterfly doesn't care if you've got an arbor or a trellis. I mean, it might be nice to add one to your butterfly garden at one point to have people like walk through and go through an entrance. It might be nice, it doesn't, don't need it. If you have an area in the back where you just want a ground cover and you can let it go, 
you can plant that uh, corky stem passion vine on the ground and just let it go because it's only going to get up about this high. It's not going to be in an area where you're going to walk on like a frog fruit, but if you're just looking for an area to just kind of let it go and cover the ground in the back, great. If you have space for a big tree, this wild tamarind is absolutely fabulous, but you do need a big lot for it. It's a big tree, but it appeals to more than one species. The painted bunting down there in the lower right is a migratory songbird that comes through Florida. Um, the orange sulfurs and the cassia blues use it. The little teeny birds like the things with the little teeny seeds on them. So you know when you go buy your bird seed, they have the little teeny seeds, and then they have the big sunflower seeds for the bullies like the uh, blue jays. <laughs> but the little birds, they like the little seeds. So stuff that has little seeds, they love. But it grows 50 to 60 feet, so you gotta have an area for it. Now out in the park, if you had an area for it, it would be a, a great plant. We gave it away at Water Matters Day last year. I do have it on my wish list this year. And uh, hopefully some of you will come out and get some free trees. Again, high salt tolerance, high drought tolerance, very pretty tree, fragrant flowers, but again, big tree. So right tree for the right place. Small yard, cinecord, lovely little tree. Only gets to 15 or 20 feet, likes full sun, prefers the well-drained soils, which we kind of have. Uh, very drought tolerant, gets a little showy flower in the spring and the summer. Great for food and cover for wildlife. Also critically imperiled in South Florida. So how many of you guys have been to Water Matters Day at Treetops? Okay. Every year the county has uh, an event at Treetops Park, Water Matters Day. And um, there's admission to the park, but the event itself is free. We gave away 2,000 trees last year, many of them critically imperiled uh, native plants in Florida. And some fruit trees, a lot of fruit trees went as well. But uh, we'll have over 50 educational booths there, and you'll get a program when you get there. If you just get stamped at 12 out of those 50 booths, you get to take a free tree home. So, yes? When is that? Um, March 10th. I've got a slide for it a little okay. bit later. Yeah, March 10th of next year. It's on a Saturday. If you have kids, there's uh, face painting. There's a lot of giveaways. Uh, we have food trucks. It's, it's really cool if you haven't been. Willow Bustic, this gets 20 or 30 feet high. This has fragrant flowers on it, nectar for the Florida dusky wing and red banded butterflies and others. So as a nectar source, that's a uh, little accent tree that you can put in the yard. But again, 20 to 30 feet. Now who would have thought that the Florida thatch palms is a butterfly larval food? So if you think in butterfly gardens, you had a certain picture in your mind of what a butterfly garden was, and I bet you that plant wasn't in it, <laughs> okay? But that's a larval food plant for the monk skipper butterflies. It's also listed as endangered. So when you're looking for palms for your yard, forget the queen palms, forget those pygmy date palms, you know, that require all of that fertilizer. Plant some forward thatch palms out there. If you're looking for some color and low ground cover, uh, nectar source for the butterflies. This is also listed as endangered in the state of Florida. This is our beach verbena. Uh, because we have lots of condos at the beaches, we don't have the beach verbena. But the beach verbena, you will, um, it's a great plant to grow. It takes crappy soil since it grows down by the beach. So you don't need to do a heck of a lot for it. Full sun though. And Gallardia, one of the best things that happened to us down here in Florida was a few years back when the uh, impatient industry got whacked with a fungus. So everybody stopped, had, had to stop buying the impatients for a while. I personally love them, but they are water guzzlers. Um, this here is our native blanket flower called Indian blanket flower. It's a native perennial. It will grow one to three feet. The flowers are going to attract hummingbirds and butterflies, and when it goes to seed, the birds will come, the migratory birds will eat the seeds in the fall. So this would be a great low plant to put around the edge. You probably want to, depending on whether your, your garden is approached and has a backdrop, or if it's something that you approach from different sides and around, you would plant your shorter plants along the edge and then build up to your taller plants in the center, 
or your lower plants in the front and the taller plants towards the back. Again, this is that dune sunflower. I planted this out west. It was not a good idea because we have um, better soil out west than you do down at the beach. On the beach, this will grow in sand, practically. This you can put in median strips. This is gonna grow. You put it in good soil, it grows like crazy. I put one plant in my front yard and it grew 15 feet wide. And I was out there cutting it all the time. So I ended up pulling it out in a pot or in a sandier area where you don't have a lot of soil amendment. Perfect, great. The Jamaican caper is a little shrub beautiful little shrub. I love those flowers on it. It looks almost like an orchid or a fascinator for your hair. <laughs> and uh, it has those beautiful white flowers. And um, it can be a small tree or a shrub. It is a larval host plant for the white butterflies. The Bahama Cassia, we talked about this one. If you've got a spot in your butterfly garden for this, I highly recommend this one. You will get those sulfur butterflies. They will come. Some butterflies like rotting fruit. So if you have fruit trees in your yard and some of the fruit falls in the ground, the, the butterflies are gonna go to that. Some people actually put out a little platform and put some rotting fruit there, but you're gonna attract a lot of other stuff too. The puddling stations. I talked about this a little bit earlier. It's nice to have a puddling station. It can be really easy. If you just take a saucer for a plant, and either put some gravel in it or some sand and just a little bit of water in it, the male butterflies go to that. The male butterflies are looking to pick up uh, the nutrients and the minerals that's in that water. So they're not really going for the water, they're going for the minerals and they need it for their sexual reproduction. So it's kind of like the guys going to the neighborhood bar after work. So the guys are going to the puddling station. Well, the Viagra is the white flowers. <laughs> the Viagra is the white flower for the studs, okay? You have white flowers in your garden, the male butterflies go to the white. Same thing, they need it for their reproduction. There's some, something in there that attracts the males. So we want to restore our native habitat. We want to reduce the pollution that enters our waterways. So the more we plant the natives, the less we have to use a lot of those pesticides and fertilizers. We want to connect our children to the natural world. So where can you find these native plants? Again, you can go to the Florida Native Nurseries Organization, Florida Native Plant Societies, uh, plant giveaways, and definitely mark down Water Matters Day, March 10th. Um, Sometimes we give away up to two trees per person. Last year we had over 4,000 visitors and we gave away two trees per person. It was the first year that we actually ran out of trees. So we may do two this year, we may do just one, we'll see. But certainly come, um, you can pick up, they can go in your yard, they can go here. There's no reason why you can't come pick up some trees as long as it's okay with parks and um, plant them in your garden if they're butterfly attracting or plant them throughout the area. Plant them in your yards, plant them at schools. Now this is something, uh, Broward County was the first county certified with the National Wildlife Federation in the United States. Um, and they, uh, we have over 4,000 people who have certified their yards or businesses or schools in Broward County with National Wildlife Federation. National Wildlife Federation is a nonprofit organization. It is one of the oldest conservation organizations in the country. It goes all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt and Ding Darling. So it's a great organization. If you register your home or your garden or whatever with uh, National Wildlife Federation, there is, a, there is a fee, there's a $20 registration fee for that but you do get a year's supply of uh, their magazine and a year's membership in National Wildlife Federation, so it, it's still a good thing. And if you register with them, you automatically become recognized as a naturescape. So you can purchase signs from National Wildlife Federation for your garden. They have small ones that are cheap. They have elaborate ones made out of brass or ceramics or whatever uh, strikes your fancy. But the naturescape signs are free. 
And if you do register with National Wildlife Federation and become certified with them, you automatically become recognized as a nature scape and I would give you a free sign. Now, we have 20 cities in Broward County that have registered. Once you register, a city then has to do some performance things in order to become certified. And one of that is based on the number of people that live in that city. They would have to certify so many yards, so many schools, uh, maybe do arbor days, maybe do something like this. Planting out here would all count towards those certification points. And it sometimes takes the cities many years to do that. Fort Lauderdale just became certified last year. Sunrise just registered this year. Uh, Lauder Hill just registered this year. And Lauderdale Lakes registered. Coral Springs just became certified. So we're hoping that the city of Margate is going to register the city. And that will be another opportunity for you to share your garden knowledge with some of your neighbors and get them to certify their yards as well. So this is what the community wildlife habitat signs look like. Certainly once you get your butterfly garden in, if you have it with, you've got your larval source and you've got your nectar source, so you have food and places to raise young, you have shelter there already, you put in a puddling station, you have the four components, you could register your butterfly garden with National Wildlife Federation, and that counts. So I'm hoping that you will all do that. Um, hoping that you will all, if you haven't registered your yards already, will. Here is the Garden for Wildlife. This gives you a step-by-step -step on what they're looking for in your yard, a little checklist. You can do this snail mail, or you can do it right on your smartphone, which is cool. The uh, way to go is right on the, the computer. You can do it in just a few minutes. You have to have a large area for that, or can no, you qualify you, if you have like a six by six area? You could qualify if you did a container garden. Mm -hmm. If you had some elderly people mm -hmm. that you know in a condo that just have a little patio area or a little common area, and you did a containerized butterfly garden and you had a puddling station, that would qualify for them. And the elderly people love it. They love to sit by there and, and see the butterflies. The um, the Kling Veteran Station, Veteran uh, Facility in Sunrise put in a butterfly garden a few years ago. They certified theirs, it became Naturescape, and they actually won an Emerald Award for it from the county. So yes, it doesn't have to be a big area at all. These are all the cities that are in dark and bold here are ones that have already received their certification, and the ones that are in the lighter font are the ones that are registered. So I'm really looking forward, and I'd be happy to come back and, and give you guys more presentations on, on different aspects of that at any time. So when you have these community wildlife habitats, you have points that the city's gonna have to get. So that would be outreach program to HOAs. I'm happy to come do that. Some of you may wanna do that. I'm happy to give you PowerPoints and you can go talk to uh, people in your own community and neighbors. Volunteer trainings, yard certifications. If the city wants to do a tree giveaway, that would count we are. towards that. We are going to do that. Well, see, you might as well get registered so all that stuff counts. Get the registration yeah, in. <laughs> the butterfly garden will count. Register it today, the butterfly count will go count on Saturday. <laughs> tree giveaway, community projects like the butterfly garden, have a wildlife habitat team. That's one of the ways cities become most successful. They have somebody in the city that's a point person and you have a group of people that form a team and then go out into the community and, and talk to their neighbors or talk to different HOAs. How many of you belong to an HOA? Oh, okay. So if you belong to an HOA, sometimes it's easy to talk to your own group first. So you're improving quality of habitat. You're protecting the critical stopover habitats for migratory birds and butterflies. You're engaging your residents and your students in community pride and stewardship. So these are all benefits for these programs. Margate already has 51 certified yards here. So you already have 51 places in the city, including five schools. 51 yards plus five schools. So you've got 56 certifications in the city already. And all of these schools here are already registered. So in summary, you want to attract the wildlife. Right here, your butterflies are a good start. Food, water, cover, places to raise young, just four things. 
try and utilize native plants as much as you can. You can use exotic plants, but just make sure that they're not invasive. Check with your Flipsy list on exotics for us. Use sustainable gardening practice. NWF.org slash certify is where you can go to certify your yard. And that's it. Now, I did bring some other 